He is risen. He is risen indeed. And we have great cause to worship the risen Lord. Revelation chapter 1, verses 12 through 18. Then I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me, and on turning I saw seven golden lampstands, and in the midst of the lampstands one like a son of man, clothed with a long robe and with a golden sash around his chest. The hairs of his head were white, like white wool, like snow. His eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like burnished bronze, refined in a furnace, and his voice was like the roar of many waters. In his right hand he held seven stars. From his mouth came a sharp, two-edged sword, and his face was like the sun, shining in full strength. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. But he laid his right hand on me, saying, Fear not, I am the first and the last, and the living one. I died, and behold, I am alive forevermore, and I have the keys of death and Hades. Our glorious Lord, the first and the last and the living one, who died and behold is alive forevermore, who has the keys of death and hell, we delight to worship you. As you laid your hand on your servant John to enable him to serve you, so may your gracious hand uphold us that we may worship you in spirit and truth. Amen. And now we will sing hymn 269, Welcome, Happy Morning.
Well, this morning for our time of confession before our Lord on this Easter Sunday, I would like to read some words from Romans chapter 6 from the Apostle Paul. This will call us to confess our sins before God. Paul wrote, For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. But what fruit were you getting at that time from the things of which you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God, the fruit you get leads to sanctification and to its end, eternal life. Let's pray a prayer of confession now. I would like to first allow a couple moments for each of us to pray silently, and then I will lead in a corporate prayer of confession of sin. So let's pray together. Our God and Father, we come before you this morning confessing that we are weak and sinful people. In this time of unexpected illness, we have learned about ourselves. We've learned that sometimes the worst comes out of us, our impatience, our pride, our lack of love for others, our self-centeredness. We've seen that, Father, in our reactions to each other and to our new situation. Forgive us, Father, for being the kind of people who react so poorly to difficulties. And our Father, we confess before you that we also may be guilty of idolatry in our hearts. We may have been worshiping things we should not have worshiped. Perhaps we were finding our comfort, our courage, our strength, too much from wealth and security, too much from prosperity and safety, too much from health. O Lord, we confess before you that we, we see that our idols have failed. Forgive us for finding our hope, our courage, our meaning in the wrong places. And O Lord, now as we are today celebrating the tremendous truth that you sent a Savior, not only to die, but to rise for our salvation, help us again to find our joy and our comfort, our strength, our courage in the great truth of the resurrection that he rose for us and for our salvation. Help us to find all that we need for for life in Jesus alone. In his name we pray, amen. Hear these words again from the Apostle Paul. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord, and it's his resurrection that we celebrate today. Amen.
Our scripture readings this morning speak of the God who raises the dead and of the hope of our resurrection. In our reading from the law, Exodus chapter 3, we come to a text that Jesus used when he was refuting the Sadducees who taught that there was no resurrection. But yet they said that they believed that the law of Moses uh, was scripture, the very word of God. And so Jesus takes them to the law of Moses, to this very text in Exodus chapter 3, verses 1 through 10, to prove to them that there is a resurrection because God is the God of the living. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob had all died by the time the Lord was speaking to Moses, and yet God spoke in the present tense of being the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And so Jesus concludes, God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. Therefore, there is a resurrection. When we turn to our reading from the prophets, we read a few verses from that vision of Ezekiel in the valley of dry bones, verses 7 through 10, to see that the word of the Lord is resurrection. And then from the writings, we read from Psalm 16, that psalm that shows up as a prophecy in the New Testament of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, whose body did not see corruption, for he rose on the third day. And then for our New Testament reading, we read the account of Jesus' uh, resurrection, the reports of the empty tomb from John 20, verses 1 through 31. Hear the word of the Lord, Exodus chapter 3, verses 1 through 10. Now Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian, and he led his flock to the west side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. He looked, and behold, the bush was burning, yet it was not consumed. And Moses said, I will turn aside to see this great sight, why the bush is not burned. When the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses. And he said, Here I am. Then he said, Do not come near. Take your sandals off your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. And he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. Then the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt and have heard their cry because of their taskmasters. I know their sufferings, and I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey, to the place of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. And now, behold, the cry of the people of Israel has come to me, and I have also seen the oppression with which the Egyptians oppress them. Come, I will send you to Pharaoh that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. Now turning to the prophets, to Ezekiel 37, verses 7 through 10. So I prophesied as I was commanded, and as I prophesied, there was a sound, and behold, 
a rattling, and the bones came together, bone to its bone. And I looked, and behold, there were sinews on them, and flesh had come upon them, and skin had covered them, but there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, Prophesy to the breath, prophesy, son of man, and say to the breath, Thus says the Lord God, Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on these slain, that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they lived and stood on their feet, an exceedingly great army. Now turning to the writings, Psalm 16, a miktam of David. Preserve me, O God, for in you I take refuge. I say to the Lord, you are my Lord. I have no good apart from you. As for the saints in the land, they are the excellent ones in whom is all my delight. The sorrows of those who run after another God shall multiply. Their drink offerings of blood I will not pour out or take their names on my lips. The Lord is my chosen portion and my cup. You hold my lot. The lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Indeed, I have a beautiful inheritance. I bless the Lord who gives me counsel. In the night also my heart instructs me. I have set the Lord always before me. Because he is at my right hand, I shall not be shaken. Therefore my heart is glad and my whole being rejoices. My flesh also dwells secure. For you will not abandon my soul to Sheol or let your Holy One see corruption. You make known to me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. And now turning to the Gospel of John. Chapter 20, verses 1 through 31. Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early, while it was still dark, and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. So Peter went out with the other disciple, and they were going toward the tomb. Both of them were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. And stooping in, he saw the linen cloths lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came, following him, and went into the tomb. He saw the linen cloths lying there, and the face cloth, which had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen cloths, but folded up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went in, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture, that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to their homes. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb, and as she wept, she stooped to look into the tomb. And she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had lain, one at the head and one at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. Having said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and looked to him and said in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord, and that he had said these things to her. On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, 
peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. Now Thomas, one of the twelve, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see in his hands the mark of the nails, and place my finger into the mark of the nails, and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. Eight days later, his disciples were inside again, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands, and put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. This is the word of our God. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. Our affirmation of faith is the Apostles' Creed. Christian, what do you believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
I'd like to invite you to turn in your Bibles with me to Romans chapter 6. We'll be looking at Romans 6, 15 through chapter 7 and verse 6. The risen spouse. Before we read the text, let's go to the author of Scripture to seek his help. Lord, we look to you and we cleave to you because you have the words of life. Grant us understanding, we pray. Strengthen our faith and increase our love for your holy name's sake. Amen. Romans chapter 6, beginning at verse 15. What then? Are we to sin because we are not under law but under grace? By no means. Do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness? But thanks be to God that you who were once slaves of sin have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were committed, and having been set free from sin, have become slaves of righteousness." I am speaking in human terms because of your natural limitations. For just as you once presented your members as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness leading to more lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness leading to sanctification. For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. But what fruit were you getting at that time from the things of which you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God, the fruit you get leads to sanctification and its end eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Or do you not know, brothers, for I am speaking to those who know the law, that the law is binding on a person only as long as he lives? For a married woman is bound by law to her husband while he lives. But if her husband dies, she is released from the law of marriage. Accordingly, she will be called an adulteress if she lives with another man while her husband is alive. But if her husband dies, she is free from that law. And if she marries another man, she is not an adulteress. Likewise, my brothers, you also have died to the law through the body of Christ, so that you may belong to another, to him who has been raised from the dead in order that we may bear fruit for God. For while we were living in the flesh, our sinful passions aroused by the law were at work in our members to bear fruit for death. But now we are released from the law, having died to that which held us captive, so that we serve in the new way of the Spirit and not in the old way of the letter. Thus far the reading of God's holy word. And may God add his blessing to the reading of his word. Thanks be to God. Paul uses the permanence of marriage to illustrate the dramatic conversion of the soul from Adam to Christ, from the covenant of works to the covenant of grace, from the law as a letter, as Paul says, to Christ in the newness of life. Since Paul outlines this conversion in terms of marriage, bear with me as I embellish it just a bit to help us think through this picture of conversion. Imagine with me a couple. We'll call the husband Norm, representing the law. We'll call the wife Andrea, representing the human soul. Now, Andrea Akers and Andrea Weiss, this parable is not meant to reflect on you or on your husbands. In fact, if any of you should see your marriage reflected in this parable, please call Pastor Mock immediately for pastoral counseling. So, Norm and Andrea, married from their youth. Andrea can't remember a time when she wasn't married to Norm. Seems like he's always been there, a constant companion. In fact, for whatever problems the marriage may have, Norm has proven to be a faithful, reliable, predictable presence. The difficulty for Andrea is that Norm 
is very exacting. It's always, Andrea, the dishes need washing. Andrea, the clothes need folding. Andrea, the floors need sweeping. Andrea, the boy needs a diaper. Andrea, make sure we have dinner on the table at 6 sharp. Oh, Andrea, don't forget about the homeless ministry at 7.30. You need to have six pots of soup prepared. And make sure you're up early in the morning to volunteer at the Crisis Pregnancy Center. And you know, with all this coronavirus virus isolation going on, you need to pick up groceries this week for the 15 elderly couples from the church. Remember to love your neighbor as yourself. Now, it's not that Norm is a lazy husband. It's just that his only work, the thing that occupies him when he's not giving orders, is inspecting Andrea's work. Andrea, why are there spots on the silverware? Honey, these clothes are going to have wrinkles because you didn't fold them right. Andrea, you missed some dirt here in the corner. Andrea, you didn't put this diaper on right. If he has an explosion, it's going to be running down his leg. These potatoes are too lumpy, and they need more salt. Try harder next time. Dear, you know the homeless won't be able to feed themselves. You'll have to stay on until they've all had their fill. Andrea, you should know that when you picked up the groceries for the elderly, they would have need, needed toilet paper too. What's that? No toilet paper at the three stores you went to? Well, come on, dear. Put yourself in their shorts. If it was your household, you would keep looking. Am I right? My dear, you're looking exhausted. Why don't you fix up your hair and throw on some makeup so that you're more pleasant for me to look at? You don't want to make me look bad with that frowny face, do you? Now, Norm and Andrea attend Mount Sinai Chapel. So feeling really miserable about herself and about her marriage, feeling like a failure, Andrea makes an appointment to see the right Reverend Moses. After pouring her heart out, And seeking some balm for her wounded conscience, the Reverend Moses says, Andrea, Norm is right. I've studied Norm carefully over the years, and I'll tell you, Norm is holy and righteous and good. What you need, Andrea, is a new heart. Yep, your heart is not right. You need a new heart. Well, Reverend Moses had more to say about that new heart bit, but Andrea didn't quite follow all that he was saying, so she left dejected and defeated. On her way home, she stopped at the bar to get a drink and catch her breath before facing Norm again. But sitting at the bar, morally exhausted, a handsome young devil sat down beside her and offered to buy her a few more drinks. Feeling sorry for herself, she accepted. And a few hours later, she woke up at this stranger's apartment. Well, from there, Andrea went wild, throwing off all moral constraint, breaking her marriage vows, sinking down into self-destructive patterns of living, or more accurately, patterns of dying. Her heart, bitter at never being able to please Norm, just turned more and more against him so that she looked for any possible way to strike out at him. Why she would even use her marriage to Norm as a cover for the most wicked dealings. Miserable in her own wickedness, miserable under the unrelenting condemnation of Norm, Andrea said, is this marriage really Till death do us part? Did I say till death do us part? Death, she thinks to herself, would be an improvement if death would free me from this marriage. Till death do us part. Well, enter Jesus Christ. Or do you not know, brothers, that the law is binding on a person only as long as he lives. For a married woman is bound by law to her husband while he lives, but if her husband dies, she is released from the law of marriage. Accordingly, she will be called an adulteress if she lives with another man while her husband is alive, but if her husband dies, she is free from that law, and if she marries another man, she is not an adulteress. 
But shall Norm die? He is holy, righteous, and good. That's not just Moses' assessment of the law. That is Jesus' assessment. That is Paul's assessment. No, Norm won't die. Andrea must die. Romans 7, 4. Likewise, my brothers, you also have died to the law through the body of Christ so that you may belong to another. Apart from Christ, we were all uh, wed to the law. And the problem in that marriage is not that the law is bad. The problem is that we have a sin nature, which Paul calls the flesh. And that sin nature cannot be fixed by the law. The law can tell us what we're supposed to do. It can tell us where we have failed to do what we were supposed to do. It can tell us what we did that we should not have done. But the law cannot change our hearts. The law cannot help us resist sin. The law cannot free us from the dominion of sin. Under the law, that is, with the law as our husband, we have no protection from sin. In fact, sin is aroused by the law. Paul says in chapter 7, verse 5, For while we were living in the flesh, our sinful passions, aroused by the law, were at work in our members, bearing fruit for death. The old way of the written code is no way to serve God. Of course, all human religion, all religion that is not Christ, is an attempt to serve God by the written code. In chapter 6, verses 15 through 23, Paul contrasts life in Christ under grace versus life under the law. Under the law, he says, we were slaves to sin, verse 17, presenting our members, basically all of our human faculties, all of our physical strength and intellectual acumen and will to power, presenting all of that to impurity and to lawlessness, leading to more lawlessness. Verse 19. Verse 20 says, For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. If you're a Christian, you look back on your life under the law and are ashamed of that former life. Verse 21. But what fruit were you getting at that time from the things of which you are now ashamed? While the law is noble, our lives under the law were shameful. Maybe you didn't do culturally unacceptable things before you came to Christ. But you served gods of fear and pleasure and self, things which are not worthy of reverence and worship. And what is the end of that life? lived under the law, Paul says in chapter 6, verse 21, for the end of those things is death. Verse 23, for the wages of sin is death. There's only one escape from the miserable marriage to the law. There's only one escape from the death that sin brings, a death that is forever shut up in a prison of sin and misery away from the smiling face of God. The only freedom from the miserable marriage to the law is to die with Jesus Christ. How do we die with Christ? Well, the Holy Spirit unites us to Christ by faith. The Spirit grants us faith in Jesus as the Christ, the Savior of sinners, so that we see in His death the full payment of our sins. We see in His resurrection eternal life and dying with Christ. We are free from the law as a covenant of works. We are free from the penalty of the law because Christ, in dying for our sins, has paid that debt in full. Our souls no longer espoused to the law as our husband and protector. Now our souls are bound and protected 
by Jesus, who, as Paul says, has been raised from the dead. In Christ, we can say to sin, I am not defeated by you because I am forgiven by my husband. I will not serve you because not only does my husband tell me what is holy and just and good, my husband helps me. No, even better, my husband lives in me so that I serve God in his strength. This is what Paul is getting at in chapter 7, verse 6, when he says, But now we are released from the law, having died to that which held us captive, so that we can serve in the new way of the Spirit and not in the old way of the letter. Because Christ died once for all to sin, we are free from sin in union with Christ. Because Christ rose from the grave to live unto God, we are enabled to live unto God in union with the risen Christ. So we can, as Paul says in chapter 6, verse 19, present your members as slaves to righteousness leading to sanctification. Righteousness means covenant keeping. We can be faithful spouses to Christ, keeping that marriage covenant because of the power of his resurrection at work in us. The word sanctification means holiness that purity of heart that is consecrated or devoted to God. The righteousness and holiness that we are enslaved to is that same righteousness and holiness demanded by the law, but under the law, we could never attain it. And the law could not help us attain it. Under grace, united to Christ, we can render obedience to God. Romans 6.22 says, But now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God, the fruit you get leads to holiness and its end, eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. And that is real living. Wed to Christ, we are free to serve in the Spirit. Way back in Romans 1, Paul said that Christ was declared to be the Son of God in power according to the Spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. Now the Spirit of holiness or the Holy Spirit brings that same resurrection power, that eternal life into our souls. When we sing, Christ the Lord is risen today, if we are believers in Jesus, we are also singing, I am risen today, for I am risen with him. When Jesus rose from the grave, he conquered death. When we die, we die with the steadfast hope that we will rise in glorified bodies that will never die again. The corruptible will put on incorruption. The mortal will put on immortality. Because we can face death with the knowledge of Christ's resurrection, with the hope of our own resurrection, we need not be enslaved any longer to the fear of death. The book of Hebrews describes the devil as the one who, through the fear of death, holds men in lifelong slavery. Fear of death feeds people's greed thinking they have to have an, an overabundance of resources as a barrier to death. Fear of death feeds people's envy, seeing the fortune of others as a threat to our own advantage in life. Fear of death provokes people's anger, making us mad with rage when their actions jeopardize our safety. Fear of death Death can lead to the indulgence of our appetites for food and sex, even promoting gluttony and adultery with the attitude of eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. It is a kind of resignation to the dominion of death meant to mask the dread of the grave. But because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, because our souls are wed to the risen Christ, we can sing in the face of death, loose the souls long prisoned, bound with Satan's chain, 
thine that now are fallen, raise to life again. Show thy face in brightness, bid the nation see, bring again our daylight. Day returns with thee. Welcome, happy morning. Age to age shall say, hell to day is vanquished. Heaven is won today. When Jesus rose from the grave, the Spirit declared him to be the Son of God in power. If ever any doubted the effectiveness of his atoning death, the resurrection was the Spirit's seal that the Father received his payment for our sins in full. So when we sin, yes, we grieve. Yes, we rebuke ourselves. Yes, we condemn our sin. But we do not quit the fight. We know that sin does not have the upper hand or the last word. Our text this morning began with the question, what then? Are we to sin because we are not under law, but under grace? In other words, does the transfer from law as husband to Christ as husband mean that sin's dominion really is inevitable? So since we can't resist sin, we just give into it? Does the doctrine of grace just come to terms with our slavery to sin? By no means, says Paul. By no means, because you who once were slaves to sin have become obedient from the heart to the teaching or the standard of the teaching to which you were committed. And having been set free from sin, have become slaves of righteousness. So, beloved, one way that you can proclaim the resurrection of Jesus Christ is to live in the new way of the Spirit. The Holy Spirit demonstrates the fact of Jesus' resurrection through the effects of that resurrection in your present life. When you turn your eyes and your heart from impurity, you proclaim the resurrection of Jesus. When you repent of lawlessness, turning from false gods to the true and living God, turning from idolatry to the pure worship of God, turning from carelessness in speaking about God and holy matters to reverence and adoration of His name, turning your foot from treading on His holy day to honoring the Sabbath and calling His holy day a delight, turning from rebellion against authorities that He's placed in your life to give honor to whom honor is due, turning from unrighteous anger and hatred and murder to love, for neighbor and even love for enemies as true sons of your heavenly Father, turning from lust, fornication, and adultery to faithfulness in marriage and in all of your relationships, turning from envy, greed, extortion, and theft to work hard with your own hands so that you can provide for your own and have something to share with those in need, turning from lies and slander and gossip to rejoice in the truth and to protect the names of others, turning from covetousness, which is idolatry, to find your contentment in communion with the triune God. When you repent of lawlessness, you proclaim the resurrection of Jesus. My friend, apart from Christ, you are married to the law, but you can't satisfy the demands of the law. By the Spirit's grace, through faith, your soul can be wed to Jesus Christ, and Jesus is such a husband to your soul that he will give what he commands. He will fill you with love for God, delight in God's law, charity for others. From the grace by which you are forgiven by Christ, you will be empowered to forgive others. You will not be overcome by that fear of injustice, the fear that wrongs will not be righted. Christ, your heavenly spouse, will comfort you with the assurance of His perfect righteousness. Romans 12, 19 through 21 says, Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, Give him something to drink, for by so doing you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, 
but overcome evil with good. What a great exhortation. But note that it begins with a direct address. Beloved. Paul can say, beloved, not only because he loves these fellow Christians, but even more because Christ loves them. They are, as Paul said at the beginning of this letter, Romans 1.7, beloved of God. With our souls wed to Christ, we have His resurrection life, eternal life, heavenly life to overcome sin and live unto God in righteousness and holiness, proclaiming by our words and deeds, He is risen. He is risen indeed. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy, to the only God our Savior through Jesus Christ our Lord be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. Risen Lord, we praise you for your conquest over sin and death. We praise you for your gift of life, abundant life, eternal life. Grant us, Lord, our souls wed to yours so that we are one spirit with you, that we may proclaim the truth of your resurrection with lives transformed, conformed to your glorious image. In thy great name we pray. Amen. Mm -hmm.